Our lives are like a tapestry woven together by our choices, decisions and actions. Experiences in life are not meant to define us. Instead, they are part of life's lessons that are meant to shape, mold, and help us to become who God has created us to be. It is my pleasure to welcome you to another episode of Chapters. And on today's episode, we'll be listening to and learning from someone who has turned life's negative experiences into a positive story as her life continues to unfold. Today's guest is Omilola Oshikoya, Africa's premier wealth coach and also the author of a book that I consider very fantastic, The Richer Woman. Omilola, you're welcome to Chapters. Thank you so much, Pastor Tony. It's an honor to be on your show. It's an honor to have you <laughs> on the show because I know that you do a show as well, The Heart of the Matter. Yeah. When you wrote this book, as I, when you saw my copy, you said, I, I, when did you get this copy from? I think I was one of the people who said, who got it, maybe the first 10 copies, probably, I would mm. probably say that. It was an amazing, amazing, amazing book. And thank, thank God. Thank God, <laughs> I'm sure. So mm. the first question I'd like to ask is, how did this title come about, The Richer mm. Woman? Okay, so I didn't get the title of this book until after I had actually finished the book. Okay. Yeah, so at first, when God, was, when God said it was time to write a book, I figured and I thought, okay, it's, gonna, it's time to write a book about Do It Afraid. So Do It Afraid is a trademark that I own. Yes. And I have the Do It Afraid conferences. And it's sort of a mantra that has, you know, helped a lot of people fulfill their dreams. So I thought, yeah, okay, great stuff. I'll start writing on Do It Afraid. And then God says, okay, I want you to start sharing things that, you know, you pass through in your life things that I brought you through, some of you, the tests you've gone through, and the testimonies. And I'm like, ah, God. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, too much and like, too hard for me to do. I knew I was going to write eventually, but I thought, you know, when I'm old and great, then maybe just if I die, I'll just like book <laughs> lunch and then just die, <laughs> you know. And I thought, really, God, like now, so I kind of said, okay, well, I'm going to ask my husband first. So when my husband gave his permission. That wasn't actually what I was expecting. So I was like, you know what, nah. So I left it, and then I had the second Do It Afraid conference. And then I, I got invited to Google to speak to women in tech on finance. An amazing um, event, hundreds of women um, across, from Google and different um, other tech companies, tech entrepreneurs, talking about finance. And I had just released my Do It Afraid journal. Mm. So um, they bought a couple of copies for, um, to give out. So uh, along with another author, we were signing autographs at the back. My first autograph experience, I was really excited. <laughs> and then this lady walks up to me and wow. she says, there's a book you're writing. God says you should speed it up. <laughs> I see quarter one to 2017. This book needs to be birthed quickly. It's going to save a lot of young women are suffering in silence with no real teacher. It's going to save a lot of marriages. Now, this is not church. This was not an inspirational exactly. event. This is a tech a company, tech. the most tech company. She didn't know me, and how did she know I was writing a book? How did she know I was writing about stuff that had to do with my marriage and some mm. of the things that I had also gone through as a child? So at that point, I knew, you know what, I needed to write this book. And I started to write the book, and when I started, I wrote this book in a month. Whoa, yes. in one month? Yes, one month. I shut down social And this media. is your first writing experience? My first writing. Like I. I I mean, I used to blog, but never had written mm. a book. Literally shut down social media, declined off speaking engagement, just went out in January and said, you know, I'm going to dedicate to writing it. And then also beca began some of the um, biggest attacks I've ever faced. And the devil just started attacking my children. It just started different things started happening, injuries, accidents. And literally after I wrote the book, I was like, okay, what's this book going to be called? I just <laughs> write it, write it. And then it just came. The richer woman. 
So that's the title. I have read the book, and I know that many people have read the book, but for those watching who they've not read the book, you know, they don't know anything about your story, share a bit of your story. Because the richer woman also comes from the arc of your story mm -hmm. as well. So share a bit of your story as you said it in the book. Um, okay, so The Richer Woman is a woman's guide to true wealth. And I think for a lot of young women, um, we're looking for wealth, we're looking for success. So personally, I was a young girl who came from a very wealthy home, but when my granddad died, we went through a series of financial challenges and so many other things happened. So I grew up saying to myself, you know what, I'm going to be successful, I want to be very rich. I wanted to, you know, the glory of my grandfather, bring it back. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, um, I, was, I mean, I had big dreams. I was going to bring, you know, rebuild the company. I was going to be World Bank country manager. I mean, minister of finance, infrastructure. <laughs> like, I had all these, you know, major <laughs> dreams. And, that, you know, that was, that, if you could ask me, I wasn't even looking for marriage or anything. It was more, I'm going to, that my main goal was, I'm oh, going to be geez. successful. Thankfully, by all legitimate means, so my mother and my father, brought us up with good character and good values. So it wasn't like I was going to do anything dodgy. It was, okay, you know, I was just going to work really hard. Decided to do accounting and finance because one of my aunties worked in a bank and I just and loved the way she looked. Money. Yes, <laughs> and I said, this is it. You know, and I chose that path. Um, started working in auditing, got bored. I was like, nah, this is going to take me too long to reach my target. I think investment banking is the way to go. And I went through the whole investment banking route, which I really loved. But until life began to happen, at that point, I had kids. And I wasn't getting to spend enough time with my children. I'd wake up really early to beat traffic. And so I, I would then come back at night when it's, when it's dark as well. And so some days, I wouldn't even see my kids at all. Um, also, that obviously affected my Which marriage as well. It's almost the typical life for a lot of Oh, a lot, a today. lot of people, a lot of people, and a lot of people are just depressed, unhappy, mm. you know, and I got to that point and I was getting really frustrated. You know, I also felt trapped, trapped because I had all these fears. I had this fear of lack. I had this fear of going through what I went through, you know, as a child. You know, fear is real, like, it just prevents you from seeing anything else, you know. That is in front of you. Exactly. All you see is that thing and that oh, fear. I was just really afraid. My job was my security. It was my way to my target. I had also started, you know, living a lifestyle that I felt like, you know what, I wanted this lifestyle, you know, lifestyle of buying hair every week. Now, there's nothing wrong with buying hair, but if you're doing it every week or if you're living from paycheck, 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 I should be all unnecessary things, mm. you know. Um, I didn't really understand the correlation between how much I was spending and how much I was earning and how much I was spending. spending. You know, I didn't know the difference between good debts and bad debts. And I went and took on a loan for a car that I had the cash to pay. Mm. My first car, I didn't really have to get a Jeep, but, you know, I wanted this, you know, just so many different things. And I, I got frustrated and then I began to seek God. I went back to God, like, you know what, God, I feel stuck here. I was beginning to resent my husband because he, we had always discussed about our visions and he had his clear, thought out vision and plan, but it was like, it wasn't it fast wasn't enough. It wasn't the same as yours. Exactly. And then I started praying. I started fasting, praying for the wrong reasons as well. Praying, not necessarily, okay, God, what do you want me to do? purpose, whatever. I was more like, God, okay, let us hammer so that, you know, so I just pray. So your focus kept being that wealth. Yes. And it was really also because of where you had come from. Yes. And one of the things that I learned from your book is sometimes you don't make the correlation between our present desires and our past. Mm. And how some people might just think I'm the way I am, not realizing that you are the way you are because of things you've gone through, experiences you've been through mm -hmm. that you might not even be aware of is what's working in you. How did you come to that understanding that look? I am like this because was what happened maybe when I was young. I think it's, um, I think it's obviously in hindsight. So now that I, I, I mean, so much has happened to me, and so me seeking God, and then you know, even so, from seeking God and praying, fasting, I, I was fasting with two other ladies who were in kind of similar situations. We just weren't even close at the time. We just found out that we had the same. Thing. And they sort of had their big breakthroughs. And just as I was began, in fact, the day I was fasting for my husband on a work trip, ba work trip back to Lagos, I met someone on the plane. And that began a three-year series of temptation that eventually, I, I mean, I tried to fight it as much <laughs> as I could. 
And then even when I thought, okay, we, I, cut, I told my husband, but I didn't speak for a year, and then I ended up falling. Now, through those processes, I, you know, I have gone through discipleship classes. Okay. I'm, a, I'm an ordained youth minister. I think going through that process with God has made me understand. It's made me aware of some of the certain, some of the things that happened in my life, some okay. decisions I made, why I'm here today. And um, so you would ask me, the richer woman, I wanted to be a rich woman. But now God has taught me what true wealth is. True wealth, he wants us to be richer, not rich. He wants us to be, for, so for me, the richer woman is a woman of purpose. And when you're a woman of purpose, you find that God is not just interested in one area of your life. And most people, not just women, even men, neglect other yeah. areas. And just focus, and just on, focus on the money. And that thing affects all other areas. So... Thankfully, I, I, I'm, I, I wouldn't say, and I say it all the time, I'm not the richer woman. I am becoming yeah, the becoming, richer woman. Yes. I now have a picture of a woman that, of God's picture of who he wants me to be. Or even for men, I say, you know, my, my goal is to inspire people to live the richer life. You know, now I, I see the life, I see the woman that I, I, I aspire to be. Mm. And I'm taking, I'm prayerfully and intentionally trying to become like her. Fantastic. So yes. we'll go on a short break now. And then when we come back, we'll look into who exactly this richer woman is. Yes. We'll be right back. You are welcome back to Chapters. And on today's episode, we're talking about how we can turn life's negative experiences into positive stories, looking at it through the very unique story of Omilola Oshikoya, Africa's premier wealth coach and author of the book, The Richer Woman. And this is an episode for the richer woman, the richer man, and the, the richer, richer kids, kids <laughs> and the richer world. <laughs> So, like, before we went on the break, we were talking about, you know, becoming the richer woman. So my question is, who is the richer woman? So the richer woman is a woman fulfilling God's purpose for her. Now, I like to put the emphasis on God's purpose because there's a lot of New Age talk now on purpose, but you can fulfill your own purpose without fulfilling God's purpose. So I had the choice of whether to be dangerously vulnerable, as they have called it, by writing this book. You were dangerously vulnerable. <laughs> You know, I admired your courage. Mm, when God gives an instruction, you, you don't, you don't to want do to be it. like Jonah. I agree. <laughs> so to be dangerously vulnerable by writing this book mm. or to just pretend and just, yeah, I was having, a, I mean, my, my career was, I was successful doing great things, mm. you know, but then I would have fulfilled my own purpose. So she's a woman fulfilling God's purpose for her. And when you're fulfilling God's purpose for you, then you have an overview and an understanding of the different aspects of your life. So first of all, I would say, whether you're married or you're single, for, uh, for me, the ritual woman understands that she's first of all the father's daughter. Yes, yeah, so you broke it in the book as having three different roles. Exactly. So explain the three so roles. So the father's daughter, first of all, no, you have to know your identity. That your Identity is the beginning of everything. And mm -hmm. also the reason why there's a lot of chaos. Why is, why is there competition between men and women? Mm. Is it function of lack of identity why do you have a lot of pe people in prison and the statistics say that it's people that um, do not have father figures not even mothers it's lack of identity why do you have a lot of women you know exposing themselves or sleeping around everything boils down to identity so for me the father's daughter is your first role and that really was profound for me because that's how I, I got to know God as my father, you know, and he really helped with everything about me. And I, and I got to understand that the father sees and loves you just as you are. He's not judging you. He welcomes you. In fact, I feel like the more broken you are, not necessarily that you have to be broken, but the more broken you are, the more you can even appreciate his love for you because he did come for the broken. Yes, he, he did. He did come for the lost. He did come for those that, he didn't come for, you know, the church is not a museum for, for the saints. For the saints. It's a hospital for the weak. For me, the question would then be, a lot of the times when we talk about God as a father and after having done all that you had done, people find themselves in the place of guilt. 
And it's hard to then relate with the love of God. A lot of people then see the judging God instead of the merciful God. How did you get past? Did you ever feel any form of guilt? And how did you get past that to then be able to then see Father and God as a God of love? One of my favorite song, songs is um, Good, Good Father by Chris Tomlin because he's such a good father. Like, God is not, oh, God is, like, I don't understand where people, and it's, it's all a, you know, the ploy of the devil to make us feel like he's wicked, he's mean, he's angry, he's just going to come out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> strike you with lightning. Strike you. No, he's such a loving God because even, I remember, when, even when I was facing my temptations, you know, the Bible is true when it says he will bring a, a way of escape. Mm. You know, now it's up to you to decide to, whether to take it or not. But he's such a loving God. I mean, my, my life story is just a story of grace. My husband's birthday was coming up. And at the time, my husband, no, my husband is deep spiritually now. Like, he's so deep. I mean, like, chill now. <laughs> <laughs> like, how did you just pass me like this? But at the time, Tip Gordon went, oh, let's go out clubbing, it's my birthday. And then he goes, oh, let's go for vigil. And I'm thinking, okay, what's going on here? And then we went for vigil, and the pastor just started talking about how, you know, when God made Adam and Eve and consummated marriage, the first visitor was the devil. Mm. And how marriages, you have to protect your marriages. And then he didn't t then talks about the wife is a good thing. You are good. And he now says the husband should pray for their wives and declare over them that they are good. So you can imagine me feeling condemned and guilty. And then just seeing God just, and my husband just praying for me. And I just, I just felt the mm, love, beautiful feeling. love of God. I, I couldn't express it to him, but I just thought, wow, this can only be God. And then I went to tell my pastor, and I had this conversation with my pastor. At that time, I had also... God had asked me to leave my job, mm -hmm. you know, so I hadn't been working for like six months. I was kind of depressed because I was like, okay, God, you said I should leave to the place you would show me. Nothing was happening. I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. And then when I tell my pastor this, everything that's happened, he now goes, oh, me, temptation is not sin. And then he goes, you know what, what are you doing now? And I said, I'm not really working. I'm still, <laughs> you know. And then he goes, why don't you come and volunteer in church? And from volunteering in church, so I ended up working in church for three years. From volunteering in church, that's when I began to discover purpose. Mm -hmm. That's when I discovered that I, you know, I had a calling in media. That's where I discovered my gifts of writing. writing. You know, that's where I discovered, that's where doors began to open. That's where I became Africa's premier world coach. That's where he gave me the vision of Do It Afraid. Where I thought my life was ending, my life was, was just, just beginning. beginning. It was just starting. And so for me, that is just the love of God. And when God said it was time to tell my husband, as scared as I was, but God did say, Omi, I need you to tell him, you know, and thankfully I obeyed. And how my husband, all he did was literally, when he asked me, is that all that happened? And I said, yes, and then he hugged me and he prayed, prayed for me. You. I mean, that is just the love of God. And then seeing how God has birthed purpose from this, you know, I've written a book. I've written a book that has been launched in 11 in cities. Different, yeah, exactly. You've gone from, I started round. in London. I've been to Dubai. I've been to South Africa, Kenya. People all as far back, as far as Australia, Hong Kong, all over the world are looking for this book. I'm getting stories, testimonies of people reading it. This is a 256-page book. I mean, I've had someone that says she read it in less than two hours. Wow. Yes, but most people read it in a night, and these are people that don't even read. So that means that you were on a search for success, for wealth, for riches, for fame, and all of that, and you thought it was going to come a certain way. Mm -hmm. However, you said, okay, my purpose has ended. You fell, you fell, you fell in different ways. Mm -hmm. You rose again in a way that you would never have known because a lot of people are watching and every one of us mm -hmm. is in search of, you know, mm -hmm. that thing that just makes us feel that life is fulfilling. And you mm -hmm. said in your book, you said, successful does not mean famous or rich. Mm -hmm. Success to you is someone fulfilling God's purpose for her life, like you said. You seem to have stumbled into purpose. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. a lot of us want to know that we know that we know that, mm -hmm. look, this is where you're telling me to go. You have to show me the blueprint, show me the end from the <laughs> beginning, then I will follow you. Mm -hmm. For you that has stumbled in purpose, what would you advise on what you now saying, okay, Mlala, look, it's not very easy. Maybe the person is where you were, six mm -hmm. months, nothing has happened in my mm -hmm. life. And I'm in this place where I say, I'm following God, I'm being obedient, mm -hmm. uh, ask me to be the richer man. What would be your advice to that person? See, sometimes we seek 
purpose and forget the giver of the purpose. Mm. Forget the purpose giver. It can become an idol. Now, God is not so much interested in you fulfilling purpose. He's more interested, even though, yeah, that's, that's, I feel like that's just secondary. He's more interested in relationship. He's a relationship lover. That's why he, he created us. That, I mean, he, he already had perfect love in the, the tr Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy, Holy Ghost. And he decided, you know, I'm going to create man to love man. I'm going to create someone in my own image. And that's why the Bible even talks about how he would come down in the evening and fellowship with man. So God is more interested in fellowship. And that is why he never gives you the whole roadmap. I never knew what 2017, like, if he had told me everything that was going to happen in 2017, I'd be like, what? I didn't even know I was going to, the, the kind of impact this book was going to have. So God is a God of relationship. So he doesn't, he, if he gives you the full picture, the roadmap, you know what will happen? You will run with it and yeah. you forget him. Yeah. You will run with it because we are, we are created in his image. We have, we can think, we can, you know, but he's a God of relationship. So he will tell you, he will give you, okay, oh my God, write the richer woman. And I did that and I thought, okay, you know what, I'm done. And then he's like, no, you're going to launch it here. Okay, mm. launch it in London first. London. Okay, Lord, I'm done. No, mm -mm, you had just started. You're going to go to here. <laughs> then he gave me like five sisters at a time. And then I'm like, okay. Then it goes, okay, uh -huh, we're going to go here again. So it's more like, and then he says, okay, you're going to do this. So there are even more things he has told me to do about this, this you know, with this book yeah. that I know that will come out in yeah. 2018. Yeah. So he's more interested in relationship. So focus on just the relationship. Because at the end of the day, that's what is important. The relationship will make you more Christ-like, will make you more in his image, and that's what he's preparing you for eternity, for an eternity with him, an eternal relationship with him. As you focus on that relationship, he'll begin to give you the assignments. You know, we have to also remember that he's the one that is at work. So Moses did not go to him and say, God, I, I want, want to... to and save the no, yeah. he, God was at work, and he's still at work. He has a plan. He is redeeming man to himself. And so what I even do now, as opposed to praying for my own things, I say, God, where are you at work? Mm. Where can I join you at work? Because he's been at work and he's looking for people that will take you know, their things. We are praying. Sometimes pray. God, what should I pray, what about? Should I pray about? What is heavy on your heart? What do you want me to pray about? Meanwhile, we're praying for our own things. And then he'll say no. So I said, God, I remember 2016, um, January. So I usually try and take out January for God. And I did like a Daniel fast for three weeks. And I spent time and I said, God, where are you working in Nigeria? And he began to tell me, he began to show me. He said, we're going to feed the world. Then he took me to Genesis 45 and after 45 about how Joseph dealt with the famine. Then he told me that this is actually a blessing in disguise because these people that have lost their jobs are going to become entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurship is in every yes. economy. And then he says, you know what? I'm trying to revive the agricultural sector because you people have forgotten agriculture. You are not broke. You have so much wealth. Then he began to show me the opportunities. Then he said, oh, me, go and do a do it afraid agribusiness entrepreneurship workshop. And I did it. And we had over 300 people there. I didn't and spend a dime. Have come out of yes, that. I didn't spend a dime on, on um, publicity and people wonder why is it so successful because it's not my work it's God's work so God will pay for what he orders he will make sure what he but you see a lot of us are fulfilling our own thing and not God's thing fantastic moving on from there so when you take the vision that is God's vision there were three roles and the first role was the role as the father's, as the daughter. father's daughter now the role as a wife because one of the things as well is like you said you wanted, you grew up wanting to be independent, mm -hmm. which is not a bad thing. It's good to have a husband that provides for you, but mm -hmm. also as a woman, you have your own goals mm -hmm. and dreams and all of that. Mm -hmm. And it was in that search for independence, especially when you said it seemed you and your husband didn't have the same vision. vision. Mm -hmm. How should a woman who might be watching this and saying, no, I'm in th these same shoes. You know, my husband is not a bad guy, but it's just that. Mm. What I'm reaching for is not what he's reaching for. Mm. How did you work through that? And even after everything had happened, happened, how did you then work back to restoring your marriage? Okay, so you see, where, where vision, there's no alignment in vision, there's division. Okay. So my husband has his own vision. I have my own vision. Now, my own vision is to be rich, successful. My husband's vision is salvation for his kids and for them to fulfill their own purpose. So, you know, and so we had different, different visions, but what I then realized was, okay, you know what, God, what is the role of a wife? No hmm. one had ever really taught me what a role of a wife is, you know, and God speaks to me, so I'm sure you've noticed that God speaks to me through analogies. 
and you can use analogies. The palm tree, <laughs> the, but, the butterfly, the, the moth, mother, the, butterfly. the sunflower. The, you know, I was just like, how does Amila like? No, you are good with analogies. It's, it's just the Holy Spirit that just, you know, brings. And I guess then I just go and research. And really everything just revolves about God. The whole of science revolves mm. around God. You know, and so, you know, God said to me, a woman is like soil to a man. And then I went and I did some research oh, on soil. And, you know, soil wants, soil is different from sand. Now, there's also fertile soil and, and soil that's not fertile. Now, when soil, soil is like a, a composition of different things that come together. Now, a man is the seed. So a seed has potential to become this massive tree. Yeah. But if the seed does not go into soil, soil. the right soil, it can never be that tree it's supposed to be. Now, if women understand how powerful they are, mm. then we won't even compete. There's no need to compete. So a man with all that potential cannot become who he's meant to be if he doesn't go into the right soil. And so as a woman, you are meant to help a man become all that he was created to be. He will give you that seed. That even goes with reproduction as well. You know, and we incubate, we help them, we nurture them. We also, as they grow, we then even provide the, the foundation yes, for them the to... Roots, the, the roots of the seed will then go down into you exactly. as well. Exactly. Then you, you even enable him, the, 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 the roots, to get you know, water from the wellspring. So at the end of the day, I really, uh, then I understood that I cannot be truly successful if I do not uh, help my husband fulfill his own vision. Now, there's nothing wrong with me having my own vision. But you know what? As a, after the father's daughter, my next important role is to be his helpmate, to help him fulfill that vision. Then I realized as well that as a woman, when God has given you children, those are destinies, those are nations. Yeah, that God has entrusted to exactly. you. Exactly. Now you find that a lot of people, you would make all this money, become very successful. Then you end up using all your money to help to take your children to rehab. Hmm. God forbid. Amen. You cannot be truly successful if you do not train the, not just your biological children, whoever God puts around you. So God told me that this is the priority for you. And so even in all of this, the richer life, has to do with talking about children, mm -hmm. you know. So at the end of the day, I'm doing this, but I'm also helping my children. My children, at the same time, I'm helping my husband. So I spend that time with my kids. I read the Bible with them all the time. We have conversations about God all the time, you know. I I involve them in. I, I I'm discovering their gifts, and I involve them in things that will develop and nurture their gifts. Yeah. So. That way, I'm also helping my husband fulfill to his, fill so, his goal as well. Exactly. So then you see, you're living the richer life. You have, you're living a more holistic life. In fact, what you said alone is just so powerful. And what, I like what you said because when you do the father's daughter and then you do the wife and then you do the mother, in all of that, you can then begin to fulfill your own role as a person. Because I think many times the fear is, I'm giving to myself as a wife, I'm giving of myself as a mother, then where is the time for me to be me and to do me? And that doesn't stop you from exactly. doing you. So because you're in God's purpose, you know, so a lot of people feel, no, as a woman, no, you have to do you. And, mm -hmm. But wait, because it's God's purpose, he will make everything work out. God so, knows that one of the things I missed and I didn't even know, but I felt like I, it was a sacrifice and I was fine with it, was, you know what, I love traveling. Now, he's called me an itinerant minister and I'm like, okay. So God is loving and he's kind and he knows your desires. At the same time, there are women, and I mean, this, this statement is very controversial and I know it's very controversial, but there's nothing wrong if God says you are a homemaker. No, totally. There's nothing wrong and we cannot continue to put people under pressure and make them feel guilty. If God has said it, then God will provide for it. Yes. God will take care of it. Now, a lot of women do not do that or say no, don't because of fear. Mm -hmm. And now it should not, nothing should be driven by fear but by love. Now, if God says, people say, oh, there's, well, something happens to our husband. No, if it is God that has said, has then, put you there, then nothing will happen. And if something happens, he, he will take you, will you out. You yeah. out. So we must be driven by what God says, not by fear, not by what man says. And like you said in your book, in order to know who you are and what you are worth, you have to know who the Father is. Everything stems exactly. from there. So the definition of success is not how anybody has said, so God has said this is you. Do you, Do you and be fine with exactly. who he has said you are. Wow. Yeah. 
so much more to come. We'll go on a short break now. Mm -hmm. So much more after this break. This is a conversation you do not want to miss. We'll be right back. Yeah, welcome back to Chapters. And today's episode has been amazing, talking about the richer woman. And I'll just read a quote from the book. She says, the richer woman is a woman of purpose. She is not in a race or competition with anyone. She knows her unique calling and she is comfortable with it. Her goal in life is to fulfill God's purpose for her. That's when just your hashtag bam. <laughs> <laughs> Like, truly speaking, that just caps it all. Mm. But then I wanted us to talk about some components of the rich man. You mentioned things like vision, health and well-being, all mm -hmm. of that spirituality. But one of the things that caught me was belief system. Mm. Because people don't realize how that is. You know, we can say, I've given my life to Christ, I believe in Jesus and all of that. But there are some belief systems that come from where you are coming from mm. that you don't realize hold you back. Mm. How do you first discover what your true belief systems are and then how do you begin the process of changing them? Um, I think it's all about just um, self-awareness. Um, we don't... Hmm. How often do you do like self-audit mm. or self appraisal? Audits. So you have an organization, you appraise staff, um, TV programs, they have ratings. How, how often do you just take our time to just reflect, to just understand, you know, look at patterns. Um, why, is, why is this happening all the time? We're all a product of, I mean, we're all adults with children's um, experiences. True. We're all adults with children's True. experiences. So it's a function of Going back to okay, what are those things? And it, this thing is so powerful. Sure. And let me let me look. Very let powerful. me give you a, another example. I read this in one of John Maxwell's books about the elephant. And so you wonder how is an elephant that is like a five-ton elephant that is so huge? It, how is how is one small person able to you know give the elephant instructions in a circus when the elephant can just mm. run and just scatter everybody? Mm. Limiting beliefs. You know what they do when the elephant is, is young? They will tie it to a pole, a wooden pole. And so when it's a baby, it will tug. It can't free itself. They keep doing it. So the elephant gets to the point that every time it's tied to that rope. It just imagines that it can't. It can't move. Whereas from years back, it's, it can just kick everybody. Do you understand? So a lot of us patterns, things that are happening, people that are, you know, drinking alcohol, other alcoholics, people that are womanizers, it's, it's a function of so many different mm -hmm. things. Some of these things are even generational. Yes. These things can be passed through generations. So it's important to reflect and understand. First of all, you have to own it. You have to own up and be real with yourself exactly. when you have issues to get help. The problem is when you've don't think you have issues. I like, no, there's nothing wrong with me. But once you, once you, in fact, that's why you can never, they don't even allow you to take someone to rehab hmm. abroad. No. You have to decide by you yourself to that decide I want to go. You have to decide by yes. yourself, especially when you get to like 21, when yes. the person's an adult. The person has to decide themselves because you're wasting your time if you take the person to rehab. Nothing will happen. But once the person decides that, you know what, I don't like the way I'm living. I, need help. I want change. I need help. Then you can get help. So one of the things you talked about in this book that I think is very important is process. Because we're in a generation where people want things to happen quickly. And you put an, an analogy in the book that I'd never seen before. You said, you talked about Adam in the Bible, and you said the only man who didn't go through the process was Adam, and maybe that's why he failed. I mean, he just came as Adam. Mm. He didn't do it. So, you know, how can you explain to people the reason why process and time needs to have its place? God is a God of process because trust me, you know, if you don't, if you're not prepared for what you pray for, it will sabotage you and you will sabotage it. What you pray for. So God, God is a God of preparation and he takes time to prepare. He will look at you. I, I remember recently someone said to me that she saw a vision and she could see God 
standing next to me with a measuring tape mm. looking, you know, and this is me that I know that I've been through quite a lot of processes and preparation. Have I really got through it? I think I'm ready. <laughs> oh you know? Don't you think I've tried? But he knows because, you know, a lot of things we're praying for, if God should just give you like that. Mm. This is why people that win the lottery. Yes. The they're not prepared. Actually, about ninety of them lose it. Everything. 10 years they're down the not line. prepared. So everything is preparation. Unfortunately, we're in a generation that we want it fast. And if you get it fast, it will go fast. If you get it fast, it, it will go, go fast. fast. And you know, God took me. There's an analogy for process. The flourishing palm tree. So for my last week's afraid conference, the theme was the flourishing palm tree and its process. A palm tree flourishes. There's this palm tree in front of my house. At least I've been married for 11 years. That palm tree has been there, season in, season out. Coconuts, it's wonderful. Meanwhile, grass, every two weeks. In fact, every day, <laughs> we're cutting it and it's dying out. And, you know, it grows so fast and dies so fast. But the palm tree has been there. Palm trees, the, the, the coconut palm has the biggest seed in the plant kingdom because... It goes through a process. It goes through a process. And so even when the storms of life come, the winds, it can stand because of the process. And a lot of us, we just want to circumvent the process. No, yeah. we must trust the process. It is for our own good. I need to read what you said. You said the growth process of the palm tree is not like the grass that can happen overnight or in one season. First, it grows leaves, sending them on tall stalks towards the forest canopy. The juvenile stage may take decades, mm -hmm. but when it reaches adulthood, the tree starts to grow a trunk. And you actually said in your book that the palm tree is one that has leaves that are evergreen 365 Five, days yes. of the year. Evergreen. And it also, I mean, the palm tree doesn't grow in, so there are two types of palm tree, very, they're, they're different types, but the two most important parts are that most people know, and the Bible talks about actually, is the one the Bible talks about is the date palm. That one grows in the desert. Now the other one we know is the coconut, the coconut palm. palm. And they don't grow where soil is. Hmm. It's sand. There's no nutrients. But that's a whole new story trying to tell but you I know that. how... Maybe that's another book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've mentioned it in this book. Maybe that's another book. So, yeah. again, this is, you know, if we're going to go through this book from beginning to end, maybe we'll do like 10 different... It's the richer book. It's the richer <laughs> <laughs> As I'm saying, everything is richer. It's richer now. But truly speaking, you did an amazing job. You know, a, a lot of people get caught up in the story, and the story is one part. But after the story, just the part, the part two from The Richer Man on the Way Down is full of wisdom is full of knowledge is full of thought provoking things I, for me it's not even a book you read in in a hurry yes you know some people say it's in two days or two hours i'm like ah sister you try oh mm -hmm. you know it's something you read go you drop to. you go back to you i mean you analogy of the ruby the soil the palm tree the butterfly i'm just like then you jump and i'm like okay um, i'm coming first i'll come back to the book <laughs> amazing amazing job I, I wish i could take credit it was just the holy spirit just downloading. Thank you, Holy um, Spirit. Yes. So where can people get copies of this book? Okay, so you can get at Latana Books. We also have um, the majority of, at least, I know, 55 Health Plus, um, Health Plus Pharmacy mm -hmm. and Casabella Beauty Stores around the country. You can get at um, uh, the e-books on Okada, Okada Books or okay. Kindle. And then you can also get paperback copies wherever you are in the world on Amazon as well. Okay. Thank you for being a richer guest. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> for having me Thank on a richer you. show. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We yeah. have learned so much. But you see, like I said, we can't go through this book. This book is rich in all ramifications of the word. I read it and I was impacted, and I'm sure that if you read it, you'll be impacted too. And I think that in everything that we've learned, it's really, like I said, life is a journey. And regardless of the mistakes that we make, we can always bounce back from our mistakes. And the one that has crafted the journey is God, who is the one that will take us through every step of the way every day. There's nothing to be afraid about. There's nothing to be guilty about. There's nothing to be ashamed about. Pick up your life from wherever it is that you can pick it up. 
and begin the journey with God. Thank you for watching Chapters today. And remember, it is not about what you know, but what you do with what you know. Until the next episode, God bless you.